This is an Intez Alter M715, a 7-inch F15 Maxitov Cassegrain optical tube assembly telescope designed for looking up at the night sky, and today we're going to review it. So, a Maxitov gathers light with a mirror in the back, it's 7 inches worth. It directs that light into a secondary mirror, which is, you'll see that little obstruction there, which shoots the image back through a hole in the primary through this diagonal in the back, and the eyepiece, which you see sticking up here, is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. Now, this is a catadioptric or compound design telescope, which means it uses a combination of lenses and mirrors to get the job done. Many beginners have trouble distinguishing between a Schmidt Cassegrain, which is a far more popular compound telescope, and this Maxitov, but the Mac is pretty easily distinguished because of its curved meniscus corrector plate. It's flat in a Schmidt Cassegrain, but it's curved in a Maxitov. Also, the aspect ratio of the Mac is usually a little bit longer and thinner than in a typical Schmidt-Cassegrain, which tends to be shorter and stubbier. Now, unlike some other telescopes' designs, like the refractor and the reflector, which have been around for hundreds of years, the Mac is actually a pretty new design, patented only in 1941 by Russian optical designer Dmitry Maxitov. Now, Max over time have developed a reputation for being a bit of a cult scope. I think that's been helped pretty much in the beginning by the fact that they were relatively rare and expensive. I knew when I was a kid, the only thing I knew about a Maxitov Cassegrain is that I couldn't afford one. <laughs> Questars were incredibly expensive, as were their Quantum Brothers, and they still are today. Another reason for the cult-like reputation of the Maxitov is its performance. Fan sight, it's sharp, pinpoint, contrasty images as a reason why they like the design so much. It's almost as if there's some sort of magic going on here, but the truth is there isn't really any magic. What's happening here is all of the surfaces in a traditional pure Maxitop design are spherical. Spheres are the easiest things to grind and they are the easiest things to make. When things are easy to make, your quality control can get very tight. Another advantage of the Maxitov is its relatively small central obstruction. Unlike the Schmidt Cassegrain, which can have a central obstruction of somewhere around one-third, 33% or so, this particular one has a central obstruction in the range of 26 to 27%. Doesn't sound like a lot, but every little bit helps. So Maxitovs do have some disadvantages. In order for this system to work properly, it has to be quite long. F ratios of F15 are not uncommon, and in the beginning you even saw them stretched out to F23. Now modern designs may make these designs slightly aspherical, and they can bring them in a little bit. But when you do that, your surfaces are no longer spherical, and things get a little bit harder to make, and your quality control starts to slip a little bit. So there's no ideal way to do this. There's only what the designer feels is best. Another disadvantage of the Maxitov is it has a relatively long cool-down time. If you think about it, you've got two big hunks of glass in the front and in the back, and as a result, Maxitovs can be a little bit on the heavy side. So in this particular model, there's actually a small cooling fan in the back here that you can attach a 12 volt power supply to and evacuate the air before you use it. So what I did on this particular one is I was just pretty diligent about setting it outside a couple of hours before I used it, and I never even bothered to use the cooling fan myself. So again, Maxitov telescope lovers, a true passionate bunch, their passion matched perhaps only by aficionados of fine apochromatic refractors. But I'll tell you, real Mac lovers, the real devotees of this design, to them, the only real Maxitov to buy is the one that comes out of Russia. That's right, none of the other brands apply. We're giving you some basic survival tips here in case you find yourself in a room full of Mac lovers. So this is a Russian Maxitov. It is an Intez, and Russian telescopes, they kind of come and go in the United States based on what kind of distribution they can secure. Tal, Sovietsky, Intez. This one is an Intez derivative, probably the most common of the Russian telescopes that you'll find if you do see one here in the United States. There have been several versions, Intez, Intez Micro, Intez Alter, sometimes the word Deluxe is added onto the end of it. So you know, telescopes do have personalities, and the personality of a Russian telescope 
it's all business. You're not gonna find any fancy logos on this thing, no fancy marketing. And I've had telescopes in here that I've had no logos on them at all. And I've even had a couple of Russian scopes here that didn't have any markings on them whatsoever. You didn't know what it was. So usually Russian telescopes have a personality in that the optics are outstanding. They are world-class. They are some of the best telescopes I've ever seen in my life. And they are wrapped in some of the plainest cosmetics that you'll ever see. The only marking whatsoever on this thing is it does give the model name here, but it doesn't really say anything else other than the fact that it's made in Russia. So these scopes tend to be quirky. You have to be sure that what you're buying will fit what you have. So this actually is a Vixen compatible dovetail plate at the bottom. I was very thankful for that. This carrying handle at the top, I wish more telescope manufacturers would do this. I found this very handy. I used it a lot. The finder. There's no markings on it whatsoever. Uh, I'm told by the marketing literature and by people who own these things that it's an 11 by 55. That is, again, more Russian quirkiness. That is a very unusual configuration. On the back here, you have a standard schmidt cassegrain thread-on visual back and a inch and a quarter to two inch adapter and an eyepiece. Again, the eyepiece it doesn't say what kind of design it is. It doesn't even say what the focal length is. So unless you look at the instructions or read the marketing literature, you don't even know what the magnification is. You're just kind of guessing. So you'll notice here, there are actually two mounts for finders. So if the 11 by 55 is a little bit too powerful for you, you can mount a lower power finder here if you want to, to make things a little bit easier to find. So I will point out that this binder bracket mounting mechanism that you see here, I have seen this on other Russian telescopes, but this is incompatible with almost every other bracket mounting system out there. You do want to be aware of that. So I did state earlier that modern Maxitov designs are sometimes aspherical, but in a pure Maxitov design where all the surfaces are spherical, if you stop and think about it, there is no need for a conventional secondary mirror or secondary mirror holder. Since all the surfaces are spherical, all you have to do is aluminize a spot on the back of the meniscus plate. On this particular design, it is a little bit different. You'll notice it does have a conventional secondary mirror holder and a secondary mirror on it like a schmidt cassegrain This does afford the optical designer a bit of extra flexibility in designing the telescope. This design is sometimes referred to as a RUMAC. Many people are seeing that word for the first time, assume that word stands for Russian Maxitov, but it actually stands for Harry Rutten, the Dutch astronomer credited for popularizing its design. This particular Mac also has collimation screws in the back, so you have full control over the alignment of the mirrors. It comes with a nice carrying case, you may get a Barlow or some other accessories depending on where you buy it and who you buy it from. So let's get this thing up on a mount and see how it performs. So here we are with the scope on my mid-size mount. This is my Celestron AVX. I would put it on something heavier, but my CGE mount died. Guys are having trouble fixing it. That's really starting to cramp my style. So you can do this if you want. I don't know if this is a great long-term solution. I found, for example, that after doing the initial two-star line, I would have to add all four calibration stars in the firmware to get to the point where this thing is going to be accurate enough. So again, at 2600 plus millimeter focal length, I don't know if this makes a great first telescope or an only telescope, especially for a beginner. I think if you're just getting started off, you need something a little bit shorter to give yourself a little bit more breathing room. Many people find with a telescope of this focal length that it, they feel boxed in and claustrophobic. You're kind of locked into medium to high power and backing out is sort of an issue for you. I found using a 35 millimeter teleview pan optic is a necessity at least for looking at you know, deep sky objects. So I found that despite the plain industrial look of this thing, it is very well made. I didn't have any issues whatsoever. The coatings on the meniscus are excellent. There are five knife edge baffles inside. There is little to no image shift at all in the focuser, an impressive feat at this focal length. The finder is of really nice quality. It's an 11 by 55, and I found on myself almost doing a double take sometimes just looking through it. The only thing I changed was the 
SCT style diagonal. I don't like these things. Maybe you do, but I don't care for these. So I took it off. There was a moment of suspense as I threaded on a standard two inch SCT style visual back. Did it thread on? Yes, it did. Oh, I'm so thankful for that. This was not a proprietary thread. Now I can put a normal SCT visual back on it and a two inch diagonal. Everything was good. So sometimes telescopes dictate to you what they want to do. So there's no reason why you can't do deep sky observing with a Big Mac like this, but you tend not to do it. You'll use something else. Maxitovs tend to be good at lunar, planetary, and double star work. Notice those are the same descriptions you'll sometimes see given to good refractors. So I had my friend Mike over here, who's a double star fanatic. You know, the double star people in our hobby, those are the true geeks. You know, ha ha, my scope will split it, but yours won't. So here's a list of stuff that we looked at. Some of that is pretty tight, but I'll tell you, I like even the showpiece doubles that aren't that hard to split. Mizar and Alcor, Ada Cass, and Albirio. So the focal length of this thing is such that I could actually put a camera at the prime focus and I snapped away. So here is Albirio with a full frame camera. You can see orange and blue colors, very clearly discernible here, splitting double stars with a camera. That's an interesting feat. You're also going to need one of these. This is a dew shield. This is a, an Astro Zap. It's built for a C8, but it will fit the seven inch tube. You just got to bring it in a little bit. So on the moon, this is one of the very best lunar telescopes I have had in here in a very long time. Take a look at these images. I would be interested in seeing a shootout between this, the 7-inch Questar, the 10-inch Astrophysics Maxitov, and the Takahashi CN212. So for deep sky imaging, you very rarely see deep sky astrophotographs taken with a large Maxitov like this one. F ratio is just too long, it's just too slow. But you know me, I'm gonna try it anyway. Again, don't try this at home. This is just an experiment I tried for fun. But here is the ring nebula, and I'll tell you, that's something pretty interesting there. I'm getting the central star there, and this is the dumbbell nebula. That doesn't look too bad. Okay, so again, I do view this as a good second or third telescope rather than something that you use every day. It's for larger collections. It's for filling in niches in collections. And as an example of this, I have had this telescope for close to eight months now. This could be the longest period of time I've ever had a telescope in for review, and it was not by design. I didn't use it continuously those eight months. I just use it sporadically. It would go away for a while, and then I'd kind of look in the corner and say, you know what? It's a good night for double stars. I'll take this thing out. So spotty usage, it's a niche-type telescope. Just be aware of that, and you'll be fine. Okay, so let's say you want one of these things. You're going to have some trouble here because it's going to be next to impossible to find exactly this model. But you do have some options for 7-inch F15 Maxitovs. Obviously, if you have the money, go ahead and get the Questar. Other than that, the most commonly mentioned model in this class is probably the Mead 7-inch F15 Maxitov, sold in and out of their catalog for many years in LX50 and LX200 variants. This is a very good telescope, and it's the closest thing you're going to find to a cult scope within the Mead catalog. I'll warn you, the one big thing that everybody hates about that model, they put a giant heat-hogging heavy piece of metal in the back to try to get some parts commonality with some of their other telescopes. That's it on the right-hand side. It is a pain to get that thing out. If you do buy one of those things, always ask if the plate has been removed. Other than that, there has been a 7-inch F15 Maxitov in the Orion catalog for many years. As of filming right now, it do doesn't appear to be there anymore, but you can still get it in Skywatcher form. I had the Orion model in here before. I liked it a lot, and at $13 to $1,500 list, somewhere in that range, as of filming today, I think that's a very good bargain. 
if you can expand your choices a little bit, any Intez Maxitov, it, to some extent, is to be considered collectible. Some of them are Mac Newts, some of them are Mac Cassegrains, they are all fantastic. If it's a Mac Newt you're looking for, you can get one of the Saravolo models. If you can find one, those are superb telescopes. Also in the early 2000s, Orion did brand label some Intez telescopes and renamed them Argonaut. Black tube, white lettering, there was at least one Mac Cassegrain and one Mac Newt in the catalog, but unfortunately, again, very hard to find. Okay, folks, so there you have it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.